In this episode, we're in Boston, Massachusetts. We're in Boston Common, sometimes mistakenly called Boston Commons. This is a 50 acre park here in Boston. And what makes it so cool is it's been around since 1634, making it the oldest park in the United States. Right outside of the Commons Visitor Center are a trio of sculptures which depict physical representations of the ideas of learning, religion, and industry. Nothing signals recreation like a gazebo, and Boston Common has a mammoth one. The Boston Common's Parkman Bandstand is a marble masterpiece. It's a great place to take a break on your morning jog, or to just sit and contemplate your gratitude that you never started jogging in the first place. Speaking of sitting, the park is full of well-decorated seating areas perfect for an outdoor lunch break or a weekend picnic. As you'll see, Boston is full of monuments from American history. One of the Commons' most famous is the Soldiers and Sailors Monument, which has stood in the Commons since 1877 as a remembrance of the soldiers and sailors from Boston who lost their lives during the American Civil War. The North Sea Mine Barrage was one of the largest naval minefields ever constructed. A feat of this magnitude, however, was no easy task, and many men lost their lives accomplishing the barrier. This mine replica serves as tribute to everyone who helped accomplish the task. And the Commons doesn't only remind us of those who sacrificed themselves for our freedom, it also helps us enjoy those freedoms with plenty of activities such as this awesome merry-go-round which features your typical horses and a fictional cat who doesn't have to wake you up every morning to feed him. A short walk from the merry-go-round is the park's frog pond. Statues of two quirky frogs fish and preside over this sizable pond which doubles as an ice skating rink in the winter. In the summer, you'll often find kids running through the water, splashing around and cooling off. The pond has numerous signs that remind you that dogs aren't allowed in the pond, but unfortunately, I guess this fluffy guy needs to work on his reading skills. Animals are a noticeable presence all over the park. The birds and squirrels have become quite comfortable with the humans that are always around and sometimes have food. Remember, however, these are still wild animals and they are more interested in your sandwich than they are being friends. So it's best to guard your lunch around these little guys, lest they snatch it away. Like many large cities, Boston is a melting pot of cultures, and the Common is a great place to celebrate that fact. During our trip, we ran across a traditional Indian wedding procession through the park. The parade drew a good mass of onlookers and well-wishers, and we were even able to grab some of the fresh fruit they handed out to the crowd below. And while Boston celebrates people from all over the world, there is one particular culture that is probably most associated with it, the Irish. You're doing yourself a disservice if you don't stop in at least one Irish pub while you're in town. We ourselves might have made it to more than one, including the Black Rose. Since we were here in July, this was a great place to cool down with an iced Irish coffee. Boston is full of famous sites from American history. The Freedom Trail is a two and a half mile path that leads through 16 of these historical gems. One of the first places we ran across on the trail was the Old State House. This impressive building has been around since 1712, making it one of the oldest surviving buildings in Boston. We didn't make it inside the museum this trip, but we did swing into the gift shop, which contains a slew of merchandise sure to make any history nerd a happy camper. Directly outside of the old state house is a plaque commemorating the site of the Boston Massacre. Just a few blocks away from the old state house, you can find the Massachusetts current state house where new history is being made daily. Located in the Beacon Hill neighborhood, this building is home to the offices of the governor and the state legislature. Even though it's often called the new state house, this place has plenty of history. The land was once owned by America's most famous signature, Mr. John Hancock. 
The dome of the building was originally a wooden structure that would often leak until Paul Revere's Copper Company covered it. But the dome was painted in World War II out of fears that the reflections would make it easy to spot for bombing attacks. The current metallic surface was added in 1997 and is 23 karat gold. If you've got a dome of your own that you want covered in gold, it only costs about $300,000 to do. Boston and Philadelphia seem to be in a little bit of competition of who can love Ben Franklin more. And why wouldn't they be? Just look at this man, or in this case, the statue of the man. Ben was born in Boston in 1706, and this eight-foot statue of him located outside the old city hall has been here since 1856. So even though he left the city at the age of 17 to Philadelphia, this statue ensures this native-born son will be in Boston's heart forever. Right across from Ben, a donkey statue was installed in 1998, and because the donkey is also viewed as a symbol of the Democratic Party, people were soon asking for a Republican counterpart. Rather than getting a full-blown elephant, they added two footsteps to stand in opposition. Bostonians do, after all, have a history of demanding representation. This, of course, leads us to the site of the Boston Tea Party. The Boston Tea Party Museum aims to be an interactive adventure that helps dive into the story of the Boston Tea Party. The admission fee is a bit higher than several other places on the Freedom Trail, and we had so many other places to go that we didn't actually go on the tour this trip. But people tell us the experience features knowledgeable guides and actors who help bring the story to life. You even get to throw some fake tea off of a boat and imagine yourself as a true revolutionary. We're at the Paul Revere house. It only costs $5 for an adult to get in, but as you can see, we're not allowed in with our camera. The whole area around the house has a great historical vibe to it, and it's easy to imagine yourself on the lookout for approaching British soldiers. Hit it! That's what I'm talking about! Wait! Okay now, from the beginning. This is Boston Harbor, and the architecture around this area, you've got downtown over here, you have the aquarium here, uh, some neat newer style buildings over here. It's, it's just a sight to behold. I really am enjoying my time here in Boston. Uh, but the harbor, uh, I, love, I love the ocean and uh, love the sailboats and everything, and it's just a beautiful area doesn't cost you anything to come here, and there's a lot of people around here just enjoying their time. If you're interested in guided tours of Boston, the harbor is a great place to start. There's plenty of hop-on, hop-off tours that depart from this area, and if you don't want to be constrained strictly by land, it's also a good spot to catch one of Boston's famed duck boat tours. It's a car that's also a boat. How cool is that? Of course, the main attraction of the harbor area is all the ships. It's a great place to see everything from luxury yachts to small sailboats, and just relax by some waterfront. Then again, sometimes water appears where you don't want it on a trip, but when it rains in Boston, there are plenty of great bars to duck into and escape the storm. I'm at Beantown Pub getting ready to have a cold Sam Adams across from a cold Sam Adams because he's buried right over here across the street in the cemetery. The Granary Burial Ground is one of the oldest in the United States and houses the remains of some of the United States' most famous citizens. Along with Sam Adams, it's also the final resting place of John Hancock and Paul Revere. You can go searching yourself or join a tour to find all the famous headstones. The large center obelisk, labeled Franklin, might make you think Ben is beneath your feet, but it's actually a monument to Ben's parents. The Granary Burial Ground isn't the only famous graveyard in the city. Also on the Freedom Trail is King's Chapel Burying Ground. Although there aren't quite as many famous names buried here, this graveyard actually predates the granary by 30 years and is the oldest graveyard in Boston. There are over a thousand people buried in this small plot, including 
John Withrop, the first Puritan governor of Massachusetts, and Elizabeth Payne, whose story is rumored to have inspired elements of the famed novel The Scarlet Letter. But after spending all this time with the dead, it was time to check out a place a little more lively. So we headed to Fanuli Hall Marketplace, also known as Quincy Market. This place is one of the best shopping areas in Boston and is full of restaurants, artisan shops, and amazing street performers. We happened by a show being put on by a performer who goes by the name Snap Boogie. Yeah, Snap Boogie, I can't make this stuff up. Snap definitely has command over the crowd and even pulled me into the act. I was of course nervous that this guy was going to land right on top of me. But he's a true professional and his skills have even seen him featured on America's Got Talent. Do yourself a favor and check out some of his stuff online if you get the chance. And while it's great to see unique performers looking to make a name for themselves, Sometimes you want to go where people are a little more familiar. When I'm in Boston, I like to go where everybody knows my name. Cheers has two locations in Boston. If you want to walk down the iconic steps, then the Beacon Hill location is the place to go. But Fanuli Hall Marketplace is where you'll find a replica of the iconic Cheers bar. Even though people won't shout your name out when you open the door, it's a great place to grab a beer while surrounded by branded Cheers glasses and television memorabilia. If you happen to be a true Cheers fanatic, make sure and visit the gift shop at either location and grab a souvenir. In exploring all the parts of Boston, uh, we've come across Seaport. And it's like as I go from one to the next, I keep liking the next one more. And Seaport is, Seaport's amazing. Seaport is full of great restaurants and breweries. One of the most popular is Trillium, which has a nice selection of in-house brews and some amazing outdoor areas for relaxing and socializing. Seaport is also a great area to do some shopping and sightseeing. It's easy to spend a day just walking around here. The streets are filled with iconic storefronts of some of America's favorite brands, and the medians have colorful polygon sculptures of various seabirds, which help add to the happening feeling of this part of Boston. And of course, because it's near the water, it also has great seafood. A lot of people had recommended row 34 to me, including one of my great friends, Brian Davis so I definitely had to give it a try. From the moment you walk in, the smiling faces and welcoming decor let you know you're in for a great meal. I'm getting ready to eat three different kinds of raw oysters. This is sort of my first for raw oysters. Normally I eat them steamed or fried. So uh, this place does not steam them, so I'm gonna try them raw. Here we go. East Cape from Prince Edward Island in Canada. So, I guess I can eat raw oysters now. After dinner, Seaport is also a good place to experience some of Boston's fantastic nightlife scene. Many of the dance clubs in Boston are state-of-the-art with intelligent lighting that helps bring the whole space to life. 
We don't normally frequent clubs on these trips, but found ourselves at the Grand as part of a larger event, and the views of the city from the place were really amazing. Seaport isn't the only place you'll find innovative nightlife, and if you find yourself in Boston for a conference, you can rest assured that the after parties have a high probability of being truly unique experiences. However, we ourselves couldn't stay up too late though because we had to go to school in the morning. And the school in question is well known as being one of the toughest in the world. Of course, I'm talking about Harvard. We're at Harvard University and we're having a pour over at Clover. It's Ethiopian, really good coffee. The coffee at Clover was great and I'm sure is instrumental in fueling some of our country's next leaders. Harvard is just one of the many universities in the Boston area. In fact, college students make up around 7% of Boston's population. So if you want to visit the city when it's slightly less crowded, summer break is a good time to aim for. We're at Harvard University and this is John Harvard, the founder. And this has got to be one of the most beautiful college campuses I've ever ran across. And on a side note, tomorrow I will be able to say, I went to Harvard. Harvard has too many iconic buildings to name, but one place that has an indisputable influence on American pop culture is the office of the Harvard Lampoon, and its writers have included notable authors and comedians such as John Updike, Conan O'Brien, and B.J. Novak from The Office. Just walking around Harvard makes you feel like you're somewhere important. It could be because of all the elaborate arches and general grandiose architecture, but it could also be the sense that this is a place where new ideas are being created that will eventually shape the landscape of our country, something Boston as a whole has a history of. So we left Harvard uh, to walk down the road a little bit and we ran across another campus. Maybe you've heard of it, MIT. Whereas Harvard has an old school beauty to it, the campus of MIT feels a little bit like you're already in the future. Several of the buildings have a distinctly modernist feel to them. And even though most people view this university primarily as the home of future engineers and mathematicians, MIT also has fantastic athletics and arts facilities. The campus is covered in sculptures and architectural marvels. If this building reminds you of Spain's Guggenheim, it's because they have the same famous architect. The Frank Gehry Building is easily one of the most recognizable on campus. And even as MIT looks to the future, they acknowledge the sacrifices of the past. This memorial is a tribute to the MIT police officer who lost his life in the aftermath of the Boston Marathon bombing. For all the inventive buildings and sculptures, MIT is still in many ways a typical college, and you'll see students biking around the well-defined bike lanes that make all of Cambridge easy to get around. MIT sits right on the water, and if you feel like getting your Fitbit wrist party, it's a nice walk across the bridge to get back into Boston proper. The views from the bridge are a fantastic spot to see some fish and look out on the many boats in the water. But if you really 
really want to get a view of Boston, you're going to have to get a little higher in elevation. This is the Skywalk in the Prudential Building in downtown Boston, and it has 360 degree views of the city. It's essentially just a floor that they have reserved for this. It's the 50th floor, so there's also a restaurant on the 52nd floor. Although it's a little pricey for an ideal place to take selfies, the Skywalk's views are pretty spectacular. Looking down upon this city, you're struck by just how much there is to do. The Skywalk also contains some interactive exhibits that help younger visitors get a new vantage point in a different way. The displays along the inner wall of the Skywalk help tell the story of Boston's immigration and help kids get a sense of what it might be like to be in someone else's shoes. On the 52nd floor of the Prudential Building, you have Top of the Hub. And rather than pay $21 two floors down, you can come two floors up and apply that $21 towards some food. The food's maybe a little tad more than maybe a normal restaurant, but not that much more, and you get the same views. During the day, the Top of the Hub is a great place to grab a drink, but if you're coming for dinner, Make sure and make a reservation ahead of time, as this place is often booked days in advance. Boston is proud of its city's many accomplishments, and some of their proudest moments come from their many sports teams. Fenway Park is one of the world's best-known ballparks and another of Boston's long list of oldest of its kind. Since 1912, Fenway has been home to the Boston Red Sox and all of their fandom. The park has been renovated many times in its history, but the well-known Green Monster, a 37-foot wall in left field has been with it almost since the beginning. Legend has it that the owner noticed several restaurants and bars had an unobstructed view of the game, and so he created the wall to stop free onlookers. Although a little stingy, this hasn't stopped bars and restaurants from popping up all over the Fenway area. They're the perfect place to join fellow fans even when you can't get into the game. I'm at South End Buttery, a little cafe it's on the corner of Union Park and Shawmut. And this entire street of Shawmut has these little cafes on the corners, uh, all food down the road as you go. Uh, and they all look delicious, um, but I'm getting ready to have the salmon and it looks amazing. The historic South End of Boston is a vibrant neighborhood with diverse people and fantastic little shops and restaurants, which mix retail and residential. South End Buttery was the perfect spot to cap off our trip with some delicious desserts and delightful dog watching. On our walk back to the Airbnb before catching our early flight, we stumbled across Harriet Tubman Square. This beautiful little gem is a stop on the Boston Women's Heritage Trail and houses two impressive statues, both the Harriet Tubman Memorial and Emancipation. The various inscriptions and placards in this park help describe the importance of the Underground Railroad. And in this city so tied to American freedom, it's an important reminder that freedom came in many different stages. I have to admit this trip to Boston was a surprise to me. This was my first time in the city and I was struck by how different it is from other metropolises such as New York City, Chicago and the likes. There are so many incredible things to see here and your days are sure to be full no matter what your budget. Each area of this city has so many different things to offer and our trip only allowed us to see a small fraction of them. I can't wait to explore this place again and I hope your adventures here are just as fulfilling as mine were.